Aloha and welcome to another Thursday with the Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Thank you Think Tech for giving us this time and space. As always, everyone in the world that's watching, <laughs> please join in with questions and comments um, on Twitter at Think Tech High. Please feel free. The phone lines are open and ready for you. Give us a call at 415-871-2474. As a reminder, we have the show to bring on farmers across the state as well as other businesses and individuals and organizations that are part of our local food system. We want to hear what kind of work they're doing here in Hawaii, why they love what they what they do and what they kind of see as the next steps for local food and agriculture in Hawaii. And we have uh, an exciting guest that Matt will introduce. Thanks, Justine. So this week we have another exciting guest, a good friend of mine, who have been trying to get on the show for a super long time now. We've been finally able to wrestle him from all of his responsibilities and duties. Uh, with us today we have Connie Koa Schultz, who is the executive director of Kakao Ivi, a cultural farm over on the windward side of Oahu uh, in Heia. So Koa, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how it's like, all of us. Right on. Not right. Like we in the back of me. Yeah, yeah. They're all just off camera. <laughs> People can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off to a great start. I love it. That's just what I imagined. Yeah, this is exactly what I expected to. <laughs> so what, <laughs> what are we talking about again? <laughs> Farming, agriculture, yeah, Hawaii. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I don't know. So, a good start a little bit about, uh, give us a little background on uh, Kakao Evi, a little mm -hmm. bit of the history, and, and give us a little bit of the, the purpose of why the organization started. Yeah, Kakao Evi started in 2007 uh, with three beautiful Hawaiian women. And um, after that, it, it kind of, we were able to get a hold of it with us in the Ko'ola Poko Hawaiian Civic Club. And that's kind of where Kakuiwi kind of took a new turn uh, to basically looking at more land development, agricultural systems, uh, try to rebuild an ahupua and heia. And so really um, what is unique about Kakuiwi is that it's really the Ko'ola Puku Hawaiian Civic Club, kind of a partnership with Hawaii Community Development Authority, mm. the Nature Conservancy. But really I would say the foundation is um, that community in heia. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I've been fortunate with the Nature Conservancy to allow me to kind of help build it and build capacity. And then now we have uh, three great staff and a lot of community volunteers. And obviously the Kupuna of Ea have been really instrumental in the development of what we're trying to achieve now. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, what we're trying to achieve is basically the, the restoration of the Ahupu of Ea with our other partners, Papahana Kuaola, Pai Pai Ea, Hui Kumaleola. Key project, just a lot of different community organizations trying to move the whole ahupua of Heea forward. So that's, um, in a nutshell, we have a 38 year lease right now with HCDA and it's for 404 acres. Um, with our partners at NOAA and the Nature Conservancy, we're looking to kind of see um, what types of taro systems and what types of agricultural systems can provide certain ecosystem services. Meaning, you know, can taro patches actually help to enhance the environment? Can agricultural activities in Hawaii be beneficial to the environment? Yeah, not a, not a negative aspect, but a beneficial aspect. And so we've seen already uh, endangered certain native species coming back and mitigation of sedimentation and food supplies for the communities. So we, you know, we're, we feel as though we're going on, on a pretty good s spot or a, a good trajectory to one of these aina and one of the lands in Heia. In a nutshell, that's kind of what I'm doing. <laughs> anyway. Wow, well, you're not doing a whole lot, huh? No. <laughs> yeah. so, Sorry. Um, Sorry. so take it back just a little bit. Um, <laughs> so Kakao Evi is more on the, the Malka parts of the Ahupua of Heia. So when you say Ahupua, I know kind of like the quick and easy definition, yeah. uh, English definition is, is a watershed, but yeah. what, what's the larger, I guess, explanation of it? Yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of different definitions, obviously, of Ahupua. We view the Ahupua more as a tradition, was as a political boundary. Um, there are Ahupua that were divided by elevation. There are Ahupua that were divided by rivers. Um, and so those are all indications that it wasn't just a watershed. It was more built on a community, 
a political boundary of people managing mm -hmm. an area. And so that's kind of for Kakoivi and, and Heia, obviously there's, there's a lot of politics in Heia, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of great people and great communities there too. And working together, we hope to have a thriving Ahupua. But for us, it pretty much still is the kind of the watershed mm -hmm. of the Heia Ahupua. So the valleys of Haiku, Iole Ka'a, mm -hmm. um, where H3 comes through. That's okay. kind of where we're looking at. And then obviously, goes out to where Ahulaka, I mean, excuse me, not Ahulaka, goes out to where Mokapu is and obviously off in there. So mm. Kanye Marine Corps base is portions of it that belong to Hei also. Mm. And we look forward to working with them also in the right. long run, right, right, right. far off. And then you have, so you guys are in like the Malka areas and then the Makai area is yep. more the Paipai. So Ohei, Paipai yeah. is kind of in the, the ocean side and that's a great nonprofit. And then we're right above it, right Malka, or right Malka of the Long Bridge is our property. And then you have um, different ohanas in Yoleka'a, which is the valley on the right, and then you have Haiku Valley, which is on the left. Okay. So um, where H3 is, and there's different nonprofits working there too. A great school, Kamakao. So. What does it take to get um, a lease like that with HCD? Um, HCD again, or I, I, a, I, a project like yeah, this. Great question. I, I think it was <laughs> it was a fortuitous or serendipitous that we had such a great supporting person, Tony Ching at HCDA. Um, when he was there and then also we had um, some really active kupuna that have been working with the community for a very long time and mm. with all of us there it was kind of we were able to get the lease and mm. obviously support of certain politicians and you know people that have been real helpful to us mm -hmm. and um, now with, with that help that they gave us now it's kind of our obligation to make sure that we see their vision and their opportunities go forward yeah. so we, we look at more as an uh, yeah. Not so much that we have all this land, but now we have a, a big obligation to get this land going and, and heal it. Because, so. like you said, I mean, part of the the mission of your organization is is you know working in within this ahopua yeah. uh, with with the community that's in there yeah. to basically go back and restore this entire area. And one of those methods of restoration is reintroducing uh, taro kalo production yeah. in the valley. So, did, were you able to get the nineteen twenty eight image? Uh, I don't think, okay. did, you, did you email it to me <laughs> when <laughs> I asked you to <laughs> send it to me? <laughs> if, Try, you know, we could. I'm Google glad you <laughs> assume that I have <laughs> an entire database of all the historical images. I'm going to show images. you like 10 times. And, <laughs> I don't know. There's a 1928 image of all tarot patches. Should I tell them, bring the, the <laughs> nickel No, let's, well, we're going to end the break. Let's, let's, let's focus on the here yeah. and now. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. We so want to hear it from you sorry. first. So, yeah, so um, we were fortunate that we have a lot of uh, cool stories from Kupuna about what they remember and what they saw. So it's not like it's, it was in the past. They still remember as, as what it was or what it is, yeah? And um, so with the 1920 aerial image and the support of NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife and a lot of our different partners, we were able to show that it was in taro from that aspect. And I would agree, I would have other farmers do that. If you want to restore taro patches, look at as much um, traditional or historical data as you can. Because once you can prove that it was in a certain use, mm. then it's a lot easier to operate in terms of certain permits. Mm. Because you can show that it's, you're, not, you're not... Doing something new. First of all, you're not, yeah, you're not doing something new. You're not damaging wetlands to convert it back to ag. And that, that's a whole other issue of educating you know, we're, we're in the mindset that taro is healing land. Mm -hmm. Taro is beneficial for the land. Right. There are still great members of individuals that might want to see it another way, you know, growing it for wetlands and other things. Because that's a big, big challenge yeah. because you are in a wetland. Absolutely. So anytime you start getting yeah. into a wetland, is that not EPA, but what? Uh, who gets Army Corps of Engineers, okay. U.S. Fish and Wildlife, DOFA. Mm. And obviously, we, we really value in, endangered birds also. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, it's a for Kakawiwi, we, we should look at trying to the balance of everything. You know, if, if I will do nest, we stop. You know, if um, right. we, let the, we let it go. And of course, the invasive grasses come in pretty quickly after that. But we're also in the development of, of trying to farm and produce food for our community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we see endangered birds, it's, it's actually a really good thing. It's a hoilona that we're doing something right. Um, uh, we don't, so I'm trying to be super delicate because obviously there's Ohana and families in, in Hanalei that are going through major trauma and major issues with the management of, invasive, of endangered endemic mm -hmm. birds. Yeah. Um, and so we're looking, you know, we're so small, we're just kind of trying to play out and see how our 
taro patches help to enhance the environment, whether it's through the propagation of endangered birds or propagation of native fish, mitigation of sediment, those kinds of projects. Sorry. I mean, that's... <laughs> Apology. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you, and you mentioned Sorry, you like guys I'm, are I'm working rambling, so. with... Um, Noah, or also be a first. In, the, in the restoration, <laughs> it's, it's looking back yeah. in at the old images to see what was happening. Yeah. But then there is some experimentation of trying new technologies or yeah. or practices. Can you explain how that balance kind of works, or so, who helps with that? Uh, advising past, that? Yeah, so past landowners have done other activities on the land. And so um, we don't just have to deal with pure wetlands and taro patches. We have to deal a lot with um, field land and how do we rehabilitate those soils so that we can again produce food and grow things? So whether it's raised beds in a flooded plain area, a flooded field area, or trying to figure out um, how to mitigate or how to minimize um, anoxic bacteria in kind of real peated areas, it's a big issue for us in terms of taro production, taro survival. Um, and then just working with our partners at HIMV or NOAA U.S. Fish and Wildlife, just to see how, what strategies have they learned from or what strategies have they done in other wetlands and other tail patches to enhance the environment. And what is fortunate is everybody's really, really supportive of trying to get food security, but also endangered animals and birds back. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, everybody's kind of seeing the balance that we need to achieve, at least on this island of Oahu. And so we're fortunate from that standpoint. Um, the other aspect is looking at kind of water quality with the different research that we're doing in terms of showing how taro patches actually mitigate what percentage of, of turbidity decreases. Turbidity is how dirty the water is. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we found... How much soil is in the water. Yeah. So we're in the process now of getting data samplers or auto samplers to measure how much sediment is literally in the volume of water mm -hmm. as it goes through. And the initial turbidity readings, we saw a decrease of almost 70%. So that's basically having... Since this is beautifully squared, you know, taro patches, water comes in, goes through, and then leaves, and it was about four, 400 NTUs, and it ended up about 100 NTUs. So you see a massive decrease in turbidity over the whole thing. So it's a good indication that taro does enhance water quality. Nice. Yeah. Anyway, so that's kind of, and then the other thing we're looking at is uh, trying to or organic farming. Uh, so what kind of strategies can we do? I keep looking down. Oh, we got it. We got to go to commercial. <laughs> We're going to take a off. quick. That's fine. <laughs> We're going to we take gotta, a quick go to break, <laughs> and then I'm definitely excited to hear more about what you guys are growing and where that's. You were shit. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, she's at we'll the camera right, right back. there. Yeah, <laughs> we didn't even tell you which camera to look at. I know. At. I just see the light on, so we'll I figured right that's back. the one that's on. We'll be right back. Oh. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii Is My Mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo. How you doing? I'm Gordo the Tech Czar here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we co-host Hibachi Talk, where we talk about technology and bring in all kinds of cool guests. Also, my co-host with me today is Andrew, Andrew the, the Andrew the Security Guy. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching Think Tech Hawaii, and thanks for watching Hibachi Talk. We also have Angus. And you there, lad? Is Angus? I bring in all kinds of wee things. Oh, look! You see my lips moving. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha and mm. welcome back. Super smooth transition right back to Hawaii Food and Farmer Series. Um, Matt, let's get right back into it. Reintroduce our guest. And yeah. Thanks, Justine. So, yeah, we're here talking to Kaneko Schultz, the executive director from. <laughs> executive director from Kako Evi. Uh, I guess he's never been in front of a camera before. Um, Sorry, so, yeah, we're talking about. Uh, the different work that they're doing in the Ahupua'a of Heia. And um, so, yeah, so we're just kind of starting to get into, um, so you guys are, are taking over uh, a large 
basically the entire valley, entire Ahupua of Heia. Lower on the side, Maukasai. lower side, lower, lower side. side. Yeah. And so you're working with uh, the community and the political struggles. And um, so you're also having the challenges, the physical challenges of working within a wetland, and then also the regulatory challenges of, because you are working in a wetland, there's certain things that you can and cannot do, or right. you need to go through the permitting process yes. to go through. And that takes you all the way to part of, a big part of what you're trying, how to restore the area is through taro production. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about why, why is taro production so important? Okay, so you, you had some great questions and maybe I should probably talk about that and how important, can I go back to kind of how we set it up? You can, yeah, go, that, where, that, go wherever you want to go. I realize that, and yeah. I'll talk about how important taro is. <laughs> um, so Townscape Incorporated mm -hmm. was Boosie Tita and, and Sherry were great to help us. So they kind of, so they helped you with yeah. the permitting. So we had the kupuna that understood and had the memories and, and the historical knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then with Townscape, they helped us walk through the permitting process, the, the, the versions of the registering, the registering the diversions, which means all the OIs we could start to use water from again. And then um, the different permits from pre-construction notification, which allowed us to bring heavy equipment into the wetlands. Mm -hmm. And then you know moving forward with how to develop taro patches. We so going back really fast. Yeah. When you talk about diversions, that means you're the you're like reverting the water flow back to the way it used. To yeah. Be. So diversions and all wise, they always use it interchangeably. Ours are all wise systems. So traditional water systems that ran the water in certain locations in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And so we were able to register those diversions again. So where they're pulling water out of the stream to feed taro patches. And so um, having historical knowledge and then going back into the townscape helped us to go back into the Board of Water Supply, Commission for Water Resource Management. They actually had those diversions in Kaneohe, in Heea, and we were able to register them. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. I think it is. Yeah. I think it's I think it is. I'm just mess laughing. I'm like, all right, I'll stop talking. I'm just laughing at you all the time. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. But yeah, that's kind of how the system was set up, and, and through that we were able to uh, utilize the water now to start farming and so Kalo is important not only as it, the older brother but also as a food source and now we're looking at it as something that actually can help heal land if done correctly organically you know naturally. Wait so you, you just so you kind of threw it in there you're saying Kalo is this older brother yes. explain that. So it's I mean I'm sure we could do a whole show on we that. We could and you should bring in practitioners that are versed in the whole yeah. Well maybe Will you co-host for that show? With that? I mean, yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, that would be just you. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to focus on its importance as a food source from, you know, gluten-free, a lot of babies that are very allergic to a lot of things, hypoallergenic, so you can actually eat it, even if you're allergic to everything else. Um, the fact that kalo is a whole food, meaning it has protein and carbohydrates present in it. Mm -hmm. A lot of calcium also in its leaves. Um, taro is a very, very important uh, food crop for us. And obviously other native Hawaiian food plants too, Polynesian food plants, but for us, because of the way our waters are situated, because we can farm, mm -hmm. um, kalo obviously is something really important and we want to grow that. And there's a lot of different varieties, yes. right? And then so for your area, is there one particular variety that thrives or that has, um, has always been there? Yeah, so looking like a native plant, is, there are eight major varieties that were grown in the, in the past. So because our people were so um, literate, right? They, they, they could read so well, they documented a lot of things. So we can go back into those newspaper articles and, and kind of see what was written back then and what was eaten. Uh, for Kakoivi, we're focused more on food production, getting the acreages up. Uh, we have Hui Kumaliola, which is a native plant nursery above us, and they are kind of the seed bank. They have a lot of the different varieties. So in the event, as we progress in, in Hoi, in Heea, we can kind of see, okay, saltwater inundation is occurring, there's some saltwater um, mm -hmm. intrusion. What other varieties can work, whether it's manini, pa'akai, um, you know, what, what varieties can be used there where there's a lot of brackish water. So this is where you're going, uh, kind of like not necessarily against, but yeah. trying to do something new there. Yeah, and that's kind of looking of the, at... the conditions have changed. I mean, it's kind of nani kikuma, looking to the source, walking the path that our ancestors walked already. They already, f they already found areas, or they already grew taro, that could survive in better brackish areas. They already grew taro that was more hardy and anoxic conditions. So it's reading the mo'olelo, understanding those, inf understanding where to look, 
and then finding what varieties did it there. And then, and then taking that information and trying to apply it in Hea. And some work, some don't. Mm. Some of the varieties that were grown traditionally aren't, as, aren't grown as well here. Mm. Others do beautifully. So it's just, it's just really kind of knowing what our kupuna did and, and, and applying that and then kind of testing for ourselves the success or failures of that. Um, and then the rehabilitation of the community and the health of the, everyone is, is another aspect that we hope Taro can bring in terms of industry and economies and jobs. But ag is hard, as you guys both know. It's, it's, it's not a nine to five and it takes up a lot of time and your family has to be supportive and patient and. For all of us there, we're lucky that we, we have a very supportive family. Mm -hmm. so. so when you're talking about rehabilitating the community, a big part of what you guys are trying to do is, is hire and bring in, in staff and, and yeah. provide jobs. Talk a little bit about the kind of jobs that you guys are looking at and what you're currently doing and then what you're looking at into the future. Yeah, I mean, right now, um, you know, obviously jobs are limited. We're not loaded with funding lines. Our, our land is state, not KS. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, we're fortunate with the supporters that we have, and we're uh, utilizing their funding as, to the best of our abilities as efficiently as we can. Mm -hmm. And we're a small group. We have three paid staff. I'm employed by the Nature Conservancy, as, and Kakoi is one of my projects. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just slowly building it up, getting the taro, getting the soils, um, getting the soils prepped for agriculture. You know, often when you're in a taro patch, the, f the first low easy you open up, basically, it's been fallow for 50 years. So the taro that grows there are, are beautiful. They're banging. I mean, you're getting mm. four four pound corms. Mm -hmm. But if you use that number as your um, potential revenue, right. let me tell you, the next time you plant in that same patch, you're not going to get four pound corms. You're going to start burning through the 50 years of nutrients. And so yeah. over the next uh, three seasons, you're basically going to be um, conditioning that soil to what you always be dealing with, you mm -hmm. know, so it's a, it's a really wide flux. You know, you can mm -hmm. plan on a big, a big boost, the first one, second one is going to be good, third one, if you do no additives, no organic treatments, you're going to... Just diminish. It's, uh, it's going to be a lot, yeah. yeah. So, it, for Kakuivi, it was a big learning curve for us, where we... Is that, you just learned that process through experimentation, or is that knowledge well, that you uh, already... We, we, through, yeah. Trial and error. Trial and error. <laughs> We've... I think my hair wasn't as gray, and I definitely was skinnier. So, no, no, it's just it's just part of farming and knowing that you know sometimes taro does really well and other times it doesn't. The different styles of planting that we did from the pu'e pu'e, which is a mounded system, to a more flat style pake style rice planting, um, we learned that our soils, and this is mainly for hei, uh, is, is really anoxic because we have high iron content. So our Koala Mountains have some of the highest aluminum in the world. Mm. But they also have some of the highest iron in the world. Mm -hmm. So therefore you can't extract aluminum, which is a good thing, right? Mm. But because it's so rich in iron, you have this certain iron-loving bacteria that usually exist in anoxic conditions or low oxygen conditions. Mm -hmm. So like when you have a lot of organic matter and no oxygen, those bacteria thrive. So mm -hmm. if you try and plant kalo in those areas, you could be just pouring you can just be pouring new fertilizers in it, and the taro will still starve because that bacteria that's also trying to break down the organic matter will absorb it at a much faster rate. Now, you expose oxygen to that bacteria, that bacteria can't exist anymore, and now the kalo can finally start eating and growing really well. Mm -hmm. So all of our berms that are above the water table are doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. And the kalo that were planted, still fertilized, managed everything mm -hmm. in, the, in the kind of the rice style system, kind of. I mean, they, they survived, but they weren't, they weren't very big. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of something we learned. And what else are, are, what are some other specific uh, vegetables and crops you guys are planting there besides taro? Well, great question. Yeah, so obviously we're also looking at ulu. Uh, with support of Matt, we're looking at trying to plant, I don't know, 10,000. I mean, a lot of ulu, a lot of ulu. And then we're also doing sweet potato, pia, uh, in the, our, our limited dryland area. But the, main, the two main crops we're obviously looking at are taro and ulu. So our hillsides will be planted with ulu, our rows will, will be planted with ulu, and then the wetland sections will be planted with taro. And then there'll be other sections dedicated solely to like 100% native grasses, sedges, and everything. So that's the other aspect for Kakoivi is that as our farm grows and we have the National Estuarine Research Reserve and the NOAA Sentinel site, um, 
we actually want to see and we want our kids to see what a true estuary looks like, meaning the tidal wetlands, what the sad sedges and grasses, the uh, akiaki and the you know uki -uki grasses and the different natives that were present there. And then as you move up, you see a true native wetland um, and then taro patches above that. So we want, we want our kids to be able to see all aspects of what a Hawaiian wetland mm -hmm. should be from taro to true wetlands to you know, estuary systems. And we recognize that um, in most areas, the natives have a competitive advantage with the environment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the tropical areas, a lot of these California grasses and these non-native species have a competitive advantage over natives. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's say we dedicate 10 acres of land to 100% native wetland. Mm -hmm. You'll probably be throwing five full-time staff just to maintain those right, 10 right, acres right. of wetlands. Whereas uh, 10 full-time staff can manage probably 30 acres of taro. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, so the revenues generated from the taro basically the profit goes right back into the nonprofit, mm -hmm. and it gets blown on the natives. Mm. So. so is this, a, these kind of projects then, is there ever a point where our work is done, we can move on never, to the next spot? Never. It's going to be a continuous yeah. need for support and investment of resources to oh. keep this kind of system. Uh, there will always will be a need of investment for the native systems to thrive. Um, taro, we believe, will, will be that system to provide the revenue via farm added, farm value added farm products from poi and other things to then pay for the educational programs and the natural resource restoration programs. Mm -hmm. You know, from restoring the stream so that you basically can rock the stream so that when hihivai come up via the heia fish pond, they can immediately attach to a hard rock and climb themselves all the way up to Iolika. You know, so it's, it's restoring the stream systems okay. again, you know, and that all of the profit generated from the sales of Kakoivi products mm. basically get bled back into the nonprofit to pay for the natural resources. Yeah. I was just going to say, it's, I mean, it's really like you're merging conservation yeah. with uh, agriculture, where historically those two have kind of been competing against yes. each other. Yeah. And so it sounds like for a perfect system for you guys is to really have both happening within the yeah. uh, Ahopua. So uh, we're definitely going to talk more about that. Uh, we have to go take a quick break and uh, we'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Mahalo. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. Aloha and welcome back to Hawaii Food and Farmers series with you every Thursday. Um, ask Koa 5 million questions on Twitter. Come on, bring them in. Uh, Think Tech Hi or call us up at 415-871-2474. Matt, where were we? Oh, right. So we're talking to Kanekoa Schultz from Kakoa Evi, who needs to just stay back. You keep getting in front of my camera. It's fine. It's a, it's a uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like just... So we're kind of talking about... <laughs> well, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> The way uh, your organization works, there's the um, food production element as well as the con uh, yep. conservation. Um, I'm kind of curious, so these uh, products you guys are coming up with, you're, you're replenishing this food source. What are you doing with that food? Is that part of, um, you said the taro revenue yeah. is sustaining the conservation part. So if you can talk also, about like, where not, you're... Not yet. Right now, um, we have a great educator, Kamu Yim, and they're the education program. So the arms that we're doing with Noah Biwet, that's an Office of Hawaiian Affairs is a huge funder of us now. They're the ones helping to support. We hope in the long run that the farm will be able to support the nonprofit. Okay. But right now, it's the grants. Grant and aids are, is what is supporting 
the production of the farm, just because there's so much environmental work that's needed to, to again, to prep the soils. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're throwing a lot of money in to just keep the clearing. And, and we did a lot of the permits early on, so that's kind of the big cost of where it went. I mean, we had great support from Senator Noy when he was alive, and, and we still have a lot of support, but it's just um, keeping that momentum going mm -hmm. has, has been, um, well, I mean, it's, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? So we're just continuing to push forward and, and develop. That's spirit. That. <laughs> I mean, what else are we going to do? Sit much around more, and, Much more enthusiastic than before the show downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Well, then, yeah. so where's, what are some of the markets that you are um, selling your taro and so, hulu? Um, we have a staff member, Lin Jozawa, a great chef. His relations in terms of the, the different restaurants have allowed us to kind of go in there and, and sell directly. Matt has, has hooked us up quite a bit in terms of just getting to the families. Uh, we mainly grow so like through, through CSAs. CSAs and then direct farmer friend relations. You know. What are some of the restaurants that have uh, that Vino, you guys have with? Vino uh, has been great. Pig and a Lady, Sushi E E, um, Town. Pig and, I said Pig and a Lady. I just I'm just going through my whole run. <laughs> um, Leanne out in Coco Head. Um, I'm like, put me on the spot. I don't want to forget it. Yeah, okay, but yeah, good. no, I mean, but, but a lot of it is just family also. I don't think anybody's out there fact checking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Wait, Wait a minute. minute. Wait, that guy's full of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, that's kind of the process of what we're trying to do and, and get it out. And obviously, uh, the whole eel sales we do, if people want for eel or warabi. So, yeah, you didn't mention that before. Uh, some of the products that you guys grow, the, the warabi, ohio, yeah. fiddle fern. Yep. What, is, what is that? Warabi is a uh, fiddle fern, it's, a, it's actually non native but it was planted by our, our Japanese family, our ancestors, and they basically looked at, oh, it's warabi, pohole. I don't know, it's fiddle fur and salad. <laughs> and we have a lot of it growing in Heia. We also have taro, sweet potato, um, different types of um, radishes, tomo negro, uh, hakure, I mean, just diff a lot of different things that can grow in semi-acidic soils. And then as we condition the soil to get a little better, we're looking at other products. What's in like what's in the queue to plant when the soil gets better? Uh, really, whatever Nick and Lindsay want to grow, but it's just <laughs> no. It's it's looking at the market. What are, what's our strength? And obviously, our strength will be taro in the long run. Mm -hmm. But we're just uh, asparagus. They have planted a bunch of it. Uh, this last fall has been was pretty brutal for us. We we lost a lot of different products just because it got so saturated. So because of a lot of rain. Yeah, and so we're we're just kind of rebuilding from that experience. And then you said that you have a uh, 400 acres. The lease is for 400 acres. Yeah. With okay. HCB. How much is in food production? Uh, does hunting pigs count as acreage? Sure. No, no, no. I would. If that's true, then yeah, all 400 acres. Are in food production. <laughs> no, really. Um, probably we have about 12 acres in management right now. Cool. And then um, that's well, that's roads, that's areas, that's clearing areas, that's mm -hmm. just trying to get locations moving you know so because you guys are, are taking off a you know a chunk at yeah. a time and yeah. you got to prove that it works yeah. before and you gotta you, you gotta kind of include and build around it first before you can start to restore the center section so mm -hmm. we're doing a big push and if people can help support us we're looking at building about a 30 acre area um, and where if we can do 30 acres of taro uh, we're looking to double the entire capacity of Oahu Wow. And um, the that's double the capacity of taro production yeah raw taro uh, wetland taro grown in home grown on Oahu, and so that's kind of our middle corridor with the support of the state. You know, we have all of our permits, so we're in the process of trying to get that going. But that's building two roads, establishing the roads first, establishing the water system to ensure that you can have stable water, mm -hmm. and then with support of volunteers, clearing, clearing, clearing land, getting the soils ready, and then planting after that. What kind of volunteer days do you guys so have? So every second Saturday, second Saturday, if people can come out and, and help us, that would be great. Uh, we start about 8 and end about 11, 30, 12. That's and they go out and help us open up taro patches and clear areas. And we can find them. that on, looking on your website? Yeah, or? so they can go to the website, www.kakooev.org. That's three O's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, just email us right there. Magic, I know, providing green opportunities. <laughs> and then, uh, That's great. What kind of turnout do you see for that? Do you see the same people just, coming it back? It just really or? depends, you know, if um, uh, from 100 people one time to 12. But, you know, this is main thing is people are coming out to work and kind of getting established. Yeah. Usually you average about 40 people. But for us, it's more about the experience. If the kids come out, you know, obviously we, we want them to experience and we want the parents to kind of have them just go out and have repetitive visits. 
So it just really depends on if it's pouring rain, we know the diehards will show up. If it's a beautiful day, everybody will go to fish pond. <laughs> so we kind of want a little rainy, but no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Perfect, yeah, yeah the perfect, yeah, yeah. you gotta have the perfect volunteer I know. weather. Just I know those about darn that. nonprofits around us, they're just so good looking that you yeah, can't help. Yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> Too many impactful groups in the yes, area. Yeah. So, so it's, I mean, obviously impressive what you guys are doing in Haiti. How, how can this be replicated or is it being replicated in similar ways throughout the state? I think uh, we have to honor all of the different communities that have provided guidance to us, whether they're in Manuwili, Waihole, Waikane, Kahalu, um, Waipa, just different communities that have kind of helped us in that process. Mm -hmm. They'll kind of look at you like you're crazy because they've done it and then right. you see them five years, yeah, we're crazy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, well then, just to back up with that really fast, how many other uh, similar projects like this are going on of like um, restoring the... Commitment schools has, have been great in the development and support of trying to do large-scale large ahupua projects. Mm -hmm. um, is there 10? Is white, there 50? Oh, is there 40? I don't want to insult anybody. I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure. Okay. I can, I can think of at least six in my head right now. Okay. That's... But I'm sure there are more, you know. Um, but yeah, it's just... main thing is just to go out and try it first because the land will tell you pretty quickly what you can and cannot do. And then as we move forward and develop, we kind of test and see what else would need to be done. I guess the best way I can see it. So one thing I don't want to miss out before our time ends is a little background on you. So this is a huge nah. endeavor. And every time I see you, you go from like highs and the lows. I mean, it's a very entrepreneurial thing that you're going through. And uh, why, why are you doing this? What, what, what's your background? Uh, I'm grateful for my wife and I'm grateful for my kids' support. And that's pretty much why we do it for our family and our, our community. So the more highs and lows that we, we go like through... Sounds like a politician's answer. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's the truth. But the more... Um, yeah, I thank my wife, what, how many times? Or, no, no. <laughs> but it's just... Is that a she must be watching. I, no. She, anyway. Um, but no, the, the honest... honest the honest truth is if, if we go through all the heartache and the head and the hitting our head against the wall, then that's one less thing our kids have to do. And how old we, are your kids? Twelve and ten. So and how, how long have you been how long have you been in this position? Is this uh, so uh, for them are they lucky that your work and yeah. if they get to go on those Saturdays too to be kind of exposed yeah, they don't, to they this. don't enjoy it as much as they should. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> well, it's, it's more work. Young. It's, it's more young. work now than, than <laughs> No, I mean we, we uh, Went to undergrad and then came back for grad school, studied Limo under uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Dr. Abbott. Uh, we did a lot of uh, estuary and, I'm sorry, we did a lot of intertidal uh, coral reef Limo projects. I'm a phycologist by training, so I study algae, actually. Um, and so went to go work with Pai Pai, helped start Pai Pai with all the great people there, Hile, Mahina, the Kili'i, Lihai, okay. A lot of, you know, we were part of that crew. We were really young, naive, um, and uh, we did a lot of projects. Met a lot of the great community in Heia. Uh, went in for my PhD, realized I needed a job after my second child was coming. So, <laughs> yeah, my, my advisor was real thrilled. But he's, he's working for KS now, so he understands too. But no, right. um, went to go work for the Kirk. And then uh, the Kirk Kahoola Island Reserve Commission oh, okay. tried to implement certain strategies <laughs> that was there. Was the mayor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, he was he was representative at the time, but uh, on such a yeah. first name basis, <laughs> yeah, just the Kirk, the Kirk, the Kirk. The Kirk yeah, uh, worked on, uh, on on Kanaloa for a little bit, and then uh, came home with the second child because it just was was hard on the family, and it was the right thing to do because I was missing them. I wasn't seeing them very much at all, and then. Uh, a friend offered me a job at Nature Conservancy, and that's kind of how I, mm -hmm. I got the job. And then first thing was to go back into Kaneohe and try and help rebuild and revitalize the community, which seems to be one of the more sustainable strategies for environment, right? Because if you help take care of the humans and make mm -hmm. sure the humans are healthy and yeah. sustainable, then your land around them will also be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the strategy we're doing, people in nature and those products. And so one of the first things we realized was to build capacity for communities was to create nonprofits and, and other groups. And that's kind of how, with the Kola Fuku Hawaiian City Club, we started that process off. And that's where we are today. <laughs> but you said this crap. is only no, no. Uh, one of your projects. You yeah, have, with uh, the Nature Conservancy, so, you have a couple other projects. Yeah, and so there's, there's uh, great work going on in uh, Kaupulehu and Kiholo, uh, Wailuku, CMMA, um, 
Hana, we're trying to look at other projects along from Oahu, where there's all the Alan Davis Coloco, but we're not, you know, it's, it's, it's more ensuring that, obviously I'm from Oahu, so it's ensuring that the families in Wabanawa, the other places they want, you know, we won't just go in and say, hey, we're, we're here. It's like, you gotta mm. build that relationship with each other and, mm. and, and move that forward. So it's just kind of looking out and, and ensuring that we're serving our communities. And yeah. So like the families in Kihola, they're awesome. They, they get them. Um, it's just a lot of different communities that we wanted to work with. So, so what's your, I uh, imagine we only have a few minutes. I, know, I can't quite hear. Oh, OK, because I can't hear <laughs> either. So just kind of winging it. Just keep talking there. That's fine. Yeah. Oh, his head keeps blocking me out, but that's OK. <laughs> Oh, Why is the camera? You need this his camera. You need his camera time. <laughs> I do need my camera time. <laughs> uh, so as we're kind of wrapping this up with about approximately three minutes to go, I'm assuming, um, talk about, I mean, obviously this is such a huge endeavor. Um, you're going to be with Kakao OEV for a much longer time. When my board wants me out, I'll graciously say thank you. Which will be at least 10, 15, 20 years from now. Uh, what, where do you see Kakao like, wh what do you really see it doing in terms of food production, but then also the impact in the community? We hope that Kako EV can provide the support uh, needed in terms of community uh, advocacy, natural resource restoration, and food security for the Heia and Kanyohe community. Um, we know the farm in itself will not be the answer, the be all and all answer to food security for Island of Oahu, but if we can get Waihole, Waikani, and other areas that are still fallow taro patches, taro lands available mm -hmm. and, and restarted, um, that would be a huge support. You know, and that's something Kakoivi would be super interested in. Just you know, not not taking over other aina, but hey, here's fifty thousand dollars unrestricted. Don't spend it on something. <laughs> like spend it on something good, and maybe we can give you. Sounds next like you time. just restricted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know that truck? <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have bought that. Uh, yeah. But no, no, no. no. But it's, those are kind of opportunities. And, and also the educational arm and, and teaching about the mo'olelo and the different foods that our, peop our people ate and all the different activities moving forward. I really I hope if, if my staff is watching, if the brothers are watching, I'm going to do it tomorrow. So. Yeah, awesome. Nick, Nick just sent in a So tweet. we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your My story. Pleasure. I mean, in terms of food production and farms, this is definitely a new model that I've learned a lot about. Please come out. So, Please yeah, join us every second Saturday. second Saturday. Second yeah. Saturday. All right, great. And then we'll keep track of you. Oh, oh. <laughs> thanks, <boo>. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.